uh, welcome. This is a really great crowd. I'm really glad to, to, uh, to see you all here. You know, the Tuesday after Labor Day is always a little bit long. So I forget what day it is. So everyone remember that today is Tuesday and Monday. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend um, celebrating the wonders of America um, and what they've done for us. So uh, I am the Worth Chair of Sustainable Development at the University of Colorado School of Public Affairs. My background is politics and policy, and uh, although the, the sustainability series has been going on for four years now, um, I got involved with it about a year and a half ago, and the University of Colorado sort of took it on officially. But some of the original founders are here. One of them is going to speak tonight. Uh, we do have an advisory board. With the members of the advisory board who are here, just stand up and wave your hands. One student chairs back there. Say hello, everybody. And so, the whole raison d'etre behind this was to you know, get amazing people in front of a, a, a crowd in Denver, but also provide that crowd the ability to network, to talk with each other, to spread ideas, hopefully to have people, our students at the university, uh, people maybe want to switch jobs, to really have kind of a, a mind meld of folks. And so in addition to hearing a great talk every, uh, the first Tuesday of every month, we really like people to have a chance to, um, to get to know each other. Can I have the university um, or any of the students here just raise your hands also? So there's, there's usually a good group of students here. Um, since this is a University of Colorado event, we really love them to get a chance to maybe meet future employers. So um, if you can afterwards, try to introduce yourself to a student. Um, I'm really excited about our, our, our speaker tonight. Um, I mentioned we're here the first Tuesday of every month. Um, tonight's talk is called The Living Wall. In, in one month, I think it's October 4th, I think that's the right date, that Tuesday, uh, we're going to be talking about drought preparedness. Um, obviously a huge issue, there's probably one in the country who hasn't thought about um, heat and drought over what's um, happened over most of America this last summer. And unfortunately, it's, it's going to be the new normal, particularly in the Southwest. So I hope we can come to that. So I'm going to um, introduce Fred Andreas, and he's going to be introducing um, the other two speakers. So I'm going to give him a kind of a brief introduction. Um, each of these fellows tonight who are speaking are really fascinating. And I always hate reading bios. I think it's really great when people can kind of tell you about the work they do themselves. But, but Fred is a professor at the University of Colorado Denver. And he's in the uh, Department of Architect and Architecture and Applied Sciences. Um, he's doing integrated research in zero net energy buildings. Um, and he has this NSF grant that you're going to learn more about tonight. It's a $2 million funded project over five years. He has five researchers funded and two research assistants. Um, he's a professor, um, uh, and I know he usually gets a lot of the students. How many Fred students are here tonight? <laughs> Is it required? Or, you know? <laughs> Um, so please give him a warm welcome, and again, thank you all for being here. All right, well, thank you very much, but I have to make some corrections. First of all, of course, I'm the stupid architect on the project, so I'm not in charge of anything. We are a team, um, and we were put together by uh, John Zai, who I'll uh, introduce in just a second. Um, this is a project that we uh, started about uh, two years ago or so, and we have another two or three years to go. It depends on uh, who you're talking to and, uh, and how long we think we're going to end up uh, working on it. We have three of us of us presenting tonight. We have two other researchers that are here. Um, Yifu Ding and uh, Jerry Wee are uh, mechanical engineers. Uh, I'm, of course, the stupid architect. Um, John is uh, in architectural engineering. <coughs> And Kirk, Kirk Mounty is in uh, aerospace engineering. So a rather odd conglomeration of partners, one that you would imagine, uh, you, could, you could imagine there might be some disconnect in the language, which I think you'll probably get a sense of tonight. But we were just talking in, at dinner tonight. I think that one of the really uh, great things that we have is we all have a great sense of humor. And we all get along with each other, and we all pretty much are always trying to communicate in new and different ways. So that kind of cuts through a lot of the technical stuff. So I, I'm just here to give you a quick introduction, and at the very end, I'll talk about the architectural end of it. Uh, I wanted to put everybody's feet on the ground, though, first, and, and let you know what it is that we're doing. 
We're basically working with zero net energy approach to building building sciences. Our, our theory, our belief is, is that the footprint of all buildings, commercial and residential, the energy footprint, um, the conservation footprint can approach zero. That uh, lead oftentimes will save maybe 20 or 30 or 40 percent of energy uh, and about the same for water. Um, our belief is, is that we can bring those numbers to almost 100 percent savings. So it's a completely different approach. It's thinking outside the box. It's a new paradigm. I can't use enough adjectives. It's, it's really taking a look at the skin, imagining, imagining that the skin could be a source of heating, cooling, and lighting and air movement through the building, uh, eliminating a lot of the interior uh, expensive HVAC and lighting gear, which often accounts for about a third of the cost of the building, uh, moving everything to the outside and using passive systems for even the tallest of high-rise buildings. Uh, certainly uh, residential, approaches for zero energy are old, tried and true from the 1970s. Uh, and now what we're doing is we're transposing that over into changing the way we think about uh, high-rise buildings, commercial buildings, uh, industrial buildings, and utilizing the exterior environment and the skin and the interaction of the building, much like a living skin, uh, regulates heating and moisture uh, on, on a, in a biophilic kind of approach. So I want to introduce uh, John Zai. John is the uh, PI, the uh, principal investigator. He's the guy that put it all together. He's also the whipping, the guy that holds the whip and, and chases us around and makes phone calls at midnight and says, where is it? We all, we all take this very seriously, of course. This is, this is John in one of his more serious moments at the recent COBE's conference where he was wrestling one of the uh, other international scientists into the Boulder police car. So John is, uh, is a, is a long-time professor uh, at the University of Colorado uh, College of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, is, is well known for a number of uh, nationally uh, recognized grants at the National Science Foundation. Uh, he has uh, put this team together and is, uh, is really the, he's kind of the conduit between um, me on the architecture side and those smart engineers on the engineering side. He fits in between with the architecture. So with that, John. I hope that's yours. Hello, oh, everybody. Thank, thanks, Rhett. Um, thank you for having me today here to talk about the project being uh, still ongoing. So I wanted to highlight one thing. This is the National Science Foundation AFRI project. The AFRI EFRI is standing for Emerging frontiers in research and innovation. So again, this, we're not developing real solid brick right now, but we're developing something in our vision so that something could be true readily in the next 40 years. So uh, I don't want to disappoint you guys at the very end and say, hey, you can know, you talk about a brick, a wall we can touch, we can see right now. We really want to understand the fundamentals, how the building can be operated, how the building can achieve net zero energy, uh, energy efficiency. So when we talk about building, my background is odd. I got my PhD in mechanical engineering, traditional mechanical engineering background, bachelor degree, master PhD. And then I realized I need to know something, develop something which I, I can hold, I can see. So I decided to build another PhD in architecture. So I spent like 15 years of my life doing two degrees. But I think it's, it's definitely uh, something I'm uh, proud of myself. But right now, we're working on is trying to integrate <coughs> architects and also engineers from different disciplines like aerospace, materials, mechanical. They can work each work together and talk to each other. We're basically to talk to each other. It's very challenging, which you can see uh, through our projects. So I guess I guess I got it's about like five years ago. I want to introduce a little bit of context. So when I design the buildings, first thing I'll look at, different from the architecture, I want to make sure everybody loves the space, enjoy the interior space in terms of summer comfort, indoor air quality, acoustics, lightings. And then you realize how to achieve that in different ways. We can use supply air conditioner, uh, all the heating, cooling system, make sure you have constant temperature, relative to a CO2 level. But we also can open the windows and electric ventilation. We can achieve the same similar conditions. So now you understand in order to 
uh, free in this environment, basically we talk about scale of a building. That's a building empty. So the whole idea is to say, hey, can we mimic the human body, the skin? That's really a skin, right? The human body skin can adapt to the environment. Whatever outside temperature change, they can adapt to the environment by adjusting some the blood flow rate, the, the, the fat effect, right, evaporation, all stuff. So we think about it, can we do the similar stuff in building by developing new building materials in the systems? So that's coming up with all the ideas coming from the uh, biomimic concepts. The so heart, pump the blood with a lot of flow, the evaporation with the air flow, and also you have insulation. Now we're talking about space So that's the whole idea of the living wall is we wanted to simulate something like the body. So we wanted to integrate the water, the food, the air channels in this building and so, as well as some kind of polymer new materials and the phase change materials. So you store, charge, discharge the heat. So everything is based on passive uh, charge discharge. So the whole idea is whatever change outside, we want to keep the interior surface temperature constant. constant. Okay. So that's a, the dream we have. How to achieve that? Basically, look at all four levels. We have to make sure the micro scale fundamentally how the materials going to work. The polymer materials, how are they going to work as a small micro pump to transfer the heat from inside to outside or outside to inside as needed. And then we have to make sure the vessel scale, so those micro channels inside, for water or for some kind of oil or air can move around as needed. And I also have to look at the micro scale, really how can we both make those micro scale materials become a small brain. But eventually, we have to look at the linkage to the real buildings. We have the small breaks. How many breaks do we need? How do we hook up all the air systems, water systems, oil systems to the building, entire buildings? So that's why we need the help with the architects. So that's the whole general ideas. So here, I just want to go quickly through this, this slide show the current research progress. This is the second year of the uh, five year or four or five year project. So we will be working on as four teams. You can see the, the macro scale. We're we'll, we'll get, get into the details in the next few slides. But just to give you ideas, the material scientists are working on some polymer materials which can hold the micro channels like a tree branch, like the tree branch inside of the, the polymer materials, which can transfer the heat, transfer the airflow, water flow inside the wall, which is totally against the traditional idea. You think about a traditional wall design, is really want to make the wall as as tight as possible, right? You don't want to have any infiltration that goes through the wall. You want to make sure there's zero infiltration. But now we go opposite, okay? So we go this intended infiltration. It's infiltration, violation, the difference is one is you cannot control it. Cracks, air sucking, right? The violation is something we can control, okay? The traditionally, we need, a, we need a ventilator pressure for this space. When we can do that, we use the air conditioner to supply the pressure, even we don't do uh, air conditioning, but we still need a mechanical fan to pump the air into the space. But we think about it, what if we can go through the wall directly? So we can save the mechanical fan power. Okay? And also, then we'll look at how to optimize the channels. All right? You can have a straight channel, you have those arbitrary channels. What's, what's the benefit? You think about resistance, heat transfer coefficients, all this stuff. Right? And again, we talk about phase channel materials inside. Where to put it? What type of materials do we have to use the phase channel materials? Okay. So we randomly throw in, okay, or what the size of the uh, phase change materials. And the last one is really talk about integration to the building uh, uh, systems. So now let uh, Kurt talk about it from the uh, material science and also aerospace point of view, talk about it, the fundamental details. So, the overall idea, I hope, became somewhat clear. What we try to do is essentially, if you think of, we want to try to actively control the heat or the thermal energy that we want to trans move from either inside the building to the outside or from the outside to the inside. And so to some extent, you could argue what we are building with our living wall is a heat exchanger. However, there's not a central pump. The whole wall essentially breathes and pumps this energy forth and back. 
And that leads to a very fundamental or a set of fundamental problems. The first is, what is generating the pumping power? And then once we have something that pumps, how do we design the channels or the fluid, which is the media that, that transports air from the inside to the outside, uh, the, the heat from the inside to the outside, and the gas, which is the air that uses natural convection to pump it essentially vertically through the wall. And when John initially came up with this whole concept, we, we did some brainstorming and uh, thought, you know, what is something that could be actually implemented in such something like a building? As John pointed out, my background is, is aerospace. And one thing that's nice about aerospace, especially if you go to the defense side of aerospace, money doesn't really matter and we can come up with a lot of really fancy, brutally complicated, very hard to maintain solutions. <laughs> now, since most likely the maintenance budget for your building is not as large as the maintenance budget for your fighter aircraft, you have to think of different solutions, or less traditional solutions. And um, Yifu Ding and Jerry Key could at that point actually um, bring something to the table that is very relevant for in their line of research, and that's the idea of pumping fluid through the concept of hydrogels. Uh, if you don't know what a hydrogel is, um, I have to refer to, you know, this is where the talk usually <laughs> becomes a more humorous side. The most famous example for a, a hydrogel is a diaper. So what you have in a diaper is you have a medium that absorbs water. And usually the idea is that this absorption is one way which means if there is liquid in the diaper, you want to get it into this medium, which is a hydrogel. So we have something that actively sucks in water, and that's a one-way pumping method. Now here, we need essentially also something that releases water and pumps it in the, di in, in the other direction, let's say, from the inside to the outside, and from the outside to the inside of the water. And um, so now we face the challenge of how do we trigger this. So we want to uh, design essentially a diaper that not only absorbs water, but also can release water. And actually we have two diapers, one to the left and one to the right. And as my, from your side, your left diaper releases water, the other diaper has to absorb water. And so we have this rocking chair principle. And uh, as you can see that in, Diaper manufacturers are usually not very interested in this scenario because they have a, let's say, more simplistic goal. Simply absorb water and you're done. So we uh, essentially designed these hydrogels and we made them, and now I can go to my slide, we could make them temperature, temperature sensitive. This means we have the, uh, these hydrogels set up in a way and that re uh, requires a polymer physicist, so not even an engineer, we need somebody from physics, who designs these polymers such that depending on the temperature, these diapers start either releasing or absorbing water. And so what we do is essentially we tune their temperature sensitivity depending on whether the hydrogel is sitting at the outside or the inside of the water. And this is why this is, for example, an NSF project, because this goes very, very deep into chemistry, polymer physics, and the design of new materials, and only to uh, essentially lower expectations. The amount of material that we currently can create at pretty significant costs is in the order of milligrams. But this is how basic research starts. You start working on milligrams, and then you scale it up, and maybe hopefully cheap. So, the first set of, of research has really to do with the design of these uh, hypergels and the design also of the holding material. And I only want to point out something here how this works. So this is Yifu Ding's research. Yifu essentially goes in his lab, generates these, these hypergels essentially from scratch. You can buy some basic materials from some suppliers. But you see kind of how this works. It's a fabrication process and in the end he has a sample of um, of hardly something you can see. And now we test this and we look at its performance. And here is 
the, now you see kind of this becomes very researchy. This is now what gets us, which means people in material science and engineering really excited. Uh, I only want to point to this part of the slide where you see now, depending on the temperature, we can essentially make this type of spell and shrink. Now this is a little bit misleading when I say swelling is, is essentially good because you actively absorb water. The shrinkage unfortunately doesn't, is, is essentially not that it squeezes the water out. So you don't, can, you cannot wet the baby actively. You can only essentially <laughs> absorb it and then you can tell the hydrogel, stop absorbing and now essentially do nothing. So the water sits there. So what we need is on the other side now something that would have essentially the opposite behavior. And this is where really hardcore research kicks in, where we need this polymer physicist that does this. However, then we face with the next challenge, and I hope you, I, I bring this across when I say we face with the next challenge. These are all from a practical point of view, very trivial challenges. But in the context of developing these materials, there are really new challenges because people have designed and looked into hydrogels for absorbing and releasing water. and reason why people were looking at this before was actually for agriculture where they wanted to use hydrogels to essentially store water and selectively reduce this water in, for example, very dry regions of the world. Now, usually when they design this, this hydrogel sits simply you know, next to a plant that sits there. We have the problem that this thing sits in a wall and this wall hopefully has some mechanical properties which means you can lean against the wall and you know, through the wall or something like this. So we need some mechanical strength. And, and that adds a new problem to it because something that easily swells and shrinks has maybe intuitively not much uh, mechanical strength. And so now we have to equip this thing with mechanical strength and we have to figure out what's the trade-off. And you see now essentially how we, we have to do some testing such that this, this uh, hydrogel actually does some good. Okay. So once we have the hydrogel, and quite frankly, we are far, far away from getting the hydrogels that we need, but we are on a, on a good start, at least considering the slope, um, we have to put these hydrogels somewhere. You can think of the hydrogel, these are little, you know, spheres, this is some, 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 you know, not very structural material in itself. We have to put this in a holding um, matrix where this, these hydrogels sit in. And this is essentially now the next research thrust where we try now to design this matrix material that you see here up here that houses the hydrogels but also houses the channels that connect the hydrogels to the inside diaper from the outside diaper. It also allows for vertical flow of air through this thing such that this wall really breathes. And, and so now we are currently engaging in designing these kind of uh, materials here is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather complicated process. Again, we are talking about milligrams of material that we could currently generate, but here it's even more important to make this material mass fabricated, mass manufacturable, and also cheap. And uh, we are also looking at what's the right architecture of this material. And only to give you an idea, so this is some, some of the current samples, we try to find materials where we can actively control, for example, the porosity of this material and potentially change the porosity of this material as a function of space, such that the porosity of this material would continuously vary from the inside to the outside, and so on. And here are different things that we uh, look at. If you notice, so for example, here the pore size is 10 micrometers. Here it's two micrometers. So this is something that in the line of research we have to look at, that we don't nail ourselves or, or put ourselves in a very tiny window where at the end all these pores have to be a millimeter or so. We need a material architecture that allows us to vary them widely only for the sake of exploring these different things. And, and here again, that's essentially some testing that is going on, again, characterizing the mechanical properties of these materials. Now, let's assume my colleagues in mechanical engineering have done a great job, produce a hydrogel that pumps water left and right, have designed a holding pattern, 
that uh, or holding matrix uh, material that can hold the hydrogels and the phase change materials. And now we have to essentially, as engineers, we sort of simply put them in, in a shaker or shake them up and take whatever comes out. We typically want to essentially design these materials such that their microvascular structure is optimal, such that we can uh, pump the maximum amount of water from one side to the other with the given pumping power that sits in the hydrogel. And so this is my line of research. I, some people call me applied mathematician. That's not true. I'm really an aerospace engineer, but I do a lot of work on modeling and optimization of these type of problems. And what we are interested in essentially is now to find um, and predict the behavior of these flows. So here you see kind of a simulation of some very unusual tools that we develop for the design of materials where you see the temperature distribution in a flow and you can think of that we have a hydrogel here and a hydrogel here. We try now to predict how this flow goes and how to optimize it. Uh, as the luxury we have when we do this in an academic setting, we typically start with a very simplified model that tells us what's essentially going on. And to explain a little bit this line of research is this is our engineering abstraction of the living wall. You have here these hydrogels that sit here. These hydrogels essentially suck in water depending on the temperature. And you have here these vertical pipes that we use to uh, circulate air. And now the question is, that looks like a maybe potentially decent architecture, but believe me, that's not good at all. The, the, the geomet geometry of these channels, they are usually need to be highly optimized such that you can get the optimal heat exchanging effect going. And in order to do this, we develop these tools. We store typically in 2D uh, and, and look at the 2D problem. And then we throw in a lot of applied mathematics. We use different optimization approaches, combine them with different ways to model the flow, how to model the heat transfer. We use some uh, advanced simulation tools, and then we package this all together in an optimization uh, scheme. And the goal is essentially of this approach is that you are not locked in into a particular solution because this is your preset notion. Uh, what engineering these days usually try to do, at least from the re research side, is provide engineers with tools that get them to places where they would not come or go based on their intuition. And, and so this is where uh, these advanced mathematical tools work. And uh, here's, for example, only as an illustration, what I mean by going to a place where you never would have gone on your own or actually going to places that you have, would have picked automatically in the later case a verification. So here is, a, is, uh, is an example of what this optimization tool can do for you. You have here an inflow, so a fluid is coming in, the fluid has, come, has to come out here, and now you ask, how does the geometry of this flow channel look like such that you get here a minimum dissipation of energy, in this case actually dissipation of energy is used. And I only show you a simulation of the optimization process it shows you that even if you start with a completely stupid design, and I don't want to say that this work is what architects do, I completely disagree. I have a PhD in civil engineering, so I'm very close to architects, at least from an aerospace perspective. This is a really stupid design to start with, and now we will see that even if you start with something completely stupid, you get to a, a decent result, and this is usually how we show that our stuff works. <laughs> Red, it doesn't show up. What do I do? Okay, there we go. Okay, so what you see here, and it goes a little bit fast. So this optimizer does without any human intervention, takes out these bubbles. You see here uh, essentially an auxiliary field that is used by the optimizer to uh, describe the geometry. And if we wait long enough, then you will see that the optimizer or the, uh, the numerical algorithm figures out that this internal hole that forces the flow to flow around it essentially gets removed. And you see what every, hopefully, sophomore engineering student would have come anyhow is this typical nozzle-like design. And so that's essentially something 
we try to de uh, uh, develop to optimize the energy flow in in this approach, and that gets, I think, a little bit too far into the details of some numerical modeling. Uh, the one thing I want to show, because it's something that looks cool, engineering is actually very beautiful for the people that are, don't like engineering. But this here is essentially something that you use as a test case. This is a flow around the cylinder. You can think of the cylinder as one of our um, air, air ducts that we use. And you see here the velocity contours, and you see here the temperature contours of this flow. It is an extreme case because the flow velocity here is much, much higher than we expect in the living world. We would not see, this, uh, see typically this vortex shedding in, 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 a, in a ball type uh, configuration. But this gives you an idea what we're working on. And now I think I can switch over to John talking about the other aspects. All right, so now, Assuming we have the, the great helps, all comes from my colleagues in mechanical engineering and aerospace, the developing about the, the hydrogel, the pump, the diaper, right? And also the holding material, the polymer, the porous materials, the holding material, that's like wall, uh, drywall, that great insulation, and also with the channels integrated. So my goal here is really have to put all this together to become a real wall, a piece of wall, like a square foot, uh, a square meter or something. And we can quantify the, the benefit or the performance of such wall by integrating all the small pieces together. So my goal is also here uh, basically talking in two libraries. One is talk to those scientists in terms of what exact temperature gradient they have to look at. What's the capacity, the resistance, capacity, each test coefficients they have to look at. Because remember, when they show all this charts, they just randomly pick up the delta T. They say, okay, inside, outside, it could be temperature from zero to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not true, depending on the climate, right? So we need to give them specific temperature regions, temperature ranges of that, and also provide them the airflow, how much airflow we need uh, for space like this, okay? What is the heat capacity we need for the space like this? So we need to provide them the inputs, which they can, uh, the outputs, to me is the output, and for their case is the inputs. Then they can use these inputs to optimize their system, the components. On the other hand, I need to provide information to Fred, to the Ortex. Hey, really, by a square foot of this wall, how much heat can be generated, can be saved, how much air can be transferred. So that's information or we'll input to the Fred scene studies in terms of the whole systems. How can we use that as a recovery, pre warm, preheating, all stuff? Okay? So, so what I want to show here. The first one is really want to highlight the importance of building envelope. So this is just the one example. We did a bunch of studies for all the climate regions in the United States. So this is just the one and the performance of typical office buildings in a hot climate, for example, clinics. So you can see all this, the heat transfer, heat transfers are all seen, different mechanisms that can transfer heat to between inside and outside. So from here you can see this is the front infiltration wall conduction, roof conduction, window glass, and also window glass, solar, this is the frame, and this is the lighting space, and this is the occupants, internal heat also. We don't necessarily all this, but the remaining of that all relate to the building element, right? So you may ask, what about lighting? Yes, if we design an opaque wall, yeah, then we have to use electrical light. But if we uh, develop some translucent wall, so we got daylight, so we can reduce the electricity, we can reduce the cooling load for the space because we don't need electrical lights. Okay? So this is just highlight some importance. And again, this shows the, the typical, this is the summer, this is the winter. You will see this is wall conduction, roof conduction, window glass, and infiltration. All relate to the building schemes. Again, I wanted to say, why the building scheme is so critical? Because everything he transferred inside and outside, through the scheme. Okay? So now, I wanted to look at, based on the understanding of physics, so we can establish that that's something involved in the scheme. So you see there's a moisture issue, evaporation. There's air going to move inside and outside. There's a heat between inside and outside. Okay? So it's really complicated. Not to mention now, we want to have this phase change materials embedded. That makes the problem more complicated. Okay? I, I, I don't know if you guys familiar with the phase change material. Basically, you want to transfer the, the, from the you want to uh, transfer the state of the material from solid to liquid. You have to burn it, right? So that's a solid that's from the heat. 
and it becomes a liquid at the same temperature, but the store the heat in that material. Okay? So that's a, that's a some say the phase change material. What if we use phase change materials? How did you model that, the performance? So now we can come up with an equation. I'm, I don't expect you guys to anything here, but just to show you the complexity. <laughs> The, just for the wall, right? With all the scare, moisture, heat. That's all the equations we have to develop, we have to solve. Okay? As, as a scientist or engineer. So I don't want to give you that, but just give you a quick solution, answer. This is just one example. Again, this office building in Denver. Just one piece of the wall. Talk about this outside, right? This is the inside. This is a concrete block. And this is a, a, a slide of a phase change materials. You want to see how the temperature going to change? The phase change material temperature? It's the temperature, just the state, means the, the fraction of the solid versus the liquid. Okay? So this is at uh, 9 a.m. Okay? This is the summer weight in damper. So when you heat up 9 a.m., the heat can transfer from outside to inside. Haven't reached this PCM yet. So the PCM is 100% solid. Okay? Then we get into 2, uh, 3 p.m. Now the temperatures go over beyond the melting point of phase change materials, about 22. That's why you see the space chamber to part of the solid, part of the liquid. Now we store the heat inside the phase chain materials. Okay. And again, when we move on to 10 p.m., this is 100% liquid. It's already liquid. It's all stored the heat. Now, look at summer seasons in Denver. You guys say this, the course time period is about 4, 5, 8 hours. That's early morning time. At that time, put one of the heat to the space. That's the heat going to release store in this phase change material and release back to the space. Now you got the heat back to the space, you can keep the temperature as your design temperature. Okay, so you don't need any uh, heating system in the summer, right, at the full 5 a.m., which is stupid to me. But, so this is just a simple example. We, we have already developed a tool, can model a piece of wall, and we have a simple uh, building integrated with all this wall, we can model that. But you think about the original plant. We're not just talking about phase change material. We have to include the, all this hydrogel that you transfer, right, the small pump, the diaper, into it. We have to look at all this uh, porous mediums, the micro channels, because all the channels flow in and out. So that's uh, one of our PhD students work on. How to integrate all this air fluid flow channels inside and quantify the performance, the benefits, by running the systems. So now, after we got this, now we can connect this one to all the real buildings. Let's grab this one. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I thought my biggest problem was I talked in Fahrenheit, and I thought they were going to talk in Celsius. They stop at Celsius. They talk about Calvin. I can't even translate it. So look at me as the lifeboat to get you out of here in one piece, okay? Because this is, this is what, this is what, remember we're talking about zero energy buildings, okay? So um, the idea is, is that truly the, the energy footprint and the conservation footprint of a building could actually approach zero through some advanced thinking in materials and systems, and throwing out the old systems and creating completely new. So to that end, we're trying to create an entirely new approach to materials and systems to actually create zero energy, not by adding a bunch of photovoltaics or a bunch of wind, but really bringing the design paradigm down to zero and thereby opening up all kinds of great opportunities for architectural development and design. So that's, that's the goal from all of this. Um, I have two RAs, and they're both here, Tamzita Khan and Scott Rank. Scott still there? Yeah. There he is. So they're working with me um, down here in Denver um, through University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and we've been working on some modeling. So we're, we're going to bring this back down to, uh, to Earth here for a few minutes. So what we're trying, these are our goals. So we're trying to create prototypes. We're trying to create a kit of parts. We're trying to create a set of paradigm shifts that are going to be usable in the design science and both engineering and architectural design. Uh, we're working with interstitial walls, in other words, double wall systems with an airspace in between. Uh, we're, we're creating heating, cooling, lighting, and air movement through those systems, through those wall systems. We're supplying cold air from down below, ground coupled. Uh, we're collecting heat through the skin of the building, the wall of the building. 
Uh, some unusual approaches, we're, redistrib we're redistributing the heat on the cold side of a building. Anytime you've got a building, you've only got two out of power, two out of four or half the walls are usually in the sun. So what we're doing is we're redistributing the heat over to other walls in order to accentuate the uh, thermal uplift. The thermal uplift is really the, uh, the driving force behind the air movement within a building. So what we're doing is we're suggesting that we're supplanting boilers for heating, air conditioners for cooling, and fans for air distribution um, with ground couple, interstitial wall, air movement through uh, solar heated, insulated uh, walls, uh, collecting the hot heat, the hot on the high side, collecting the heat on the high side and supplying cold from ground coupling below and ventilating. John talked a little bit about it. Kurt talked a little bit about it. We're, we're, we're increasing the airflow patterns in a building by 30 to 60 fold. So we're aiming at anywhere from 10 air changes an hour to 20 air changes an hour when the normal is one third of an air change per hour. We're supplying air not at 45 degrees or 48 degrees. We're supplying air at 60 degrees. The hot air side is almost unlimited. We can get the temperatures in these interstitial walls up to about 170 degrees. 160, 170 degrees. So the idea that we were just talking about, this progression that Kurt and John were just talking about, plug into both the res residential scale and the commercial scale. John talked about it very briefly. The commercial scale is very concerned with cooling and lighting and somewhat concerned with heating. Residential is totally dependent on what the outside temperature is. If it's hot, you need cooling. If it's cold, you need heating. Pretty easy. So these are our design goals and our approach. And, and, and some of the outcomes that we're trying to create in this kit of parts are CFD, computational fluid dynamic protocols, that would be readily available to all architects and designers. And oh, by the way, understandable, you imagine. We're also going to, um, PRM is performance rating method, that's lead language. We're hoping and planning that we could plug these systems into the mainstream of lead. Lead right now is very centric on very high tech, typical, approaches to HVAC and, uh, and, and uh, uh, air ventilation systems. We would change the entire approach, and try to plug that in. Uh, the other would be Energy Plus is an NREL-based uh, uh, energy modeling program that, uh, that is used by engineers primarily, but also architects. Uh, we would uh, primarily try to uh, create modules that would allow for accurate predictions of these systems through uh, Energy Plus. Our goals, we know, we can. We have tested that we can get to 80% of commercial buildings, 80% towards zero net energy, without renewables. We can get to 100% on residential. We're trying to increase that percentage. We're trying to increase that to uh, as close to 90% of commercial uh, and remain at 100% for cooling in residential. So the cooling is the problem. Obviously, the, uh, the thing I like to say is the hotter the better for cooling, for passive cooling. That, the idea behind that is, is if you're coupled to a ground uh, or uh, some sort of a thermal sink, the hotter the better will create a greater temperature differential within this thermal uh, wall, this interstitial wall, and, and with the greater temperature differential will create a faster um, uplift of that air and a greater volume of air. So the hotter the better moves more air in the hottest of hot days. Uh, therefore, we're working with the stack effect um, and we're, we're looking at not only collecting heat within the wall and redistributing it, but we're looking at seeding cold walls at the upper half and creating an artificial thermal uplift and an artificial thermal gradient. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of what Kurt was talking about, which is this push-pull, give-take of this thermal diaper approach that we're talking about. And this is, uh, this is just basically the, the, the overview for what commercial strategies would be through an exterior wall and residential strategies would be within the envelope itself. Taking a look at the, uh, at the wall systems, we're looking at summer and winter, different, differing requirements on the interior, different reactions within the thermal wall on the exterior. Um, once again, the greater the temperature differential, the faster the column of air moves, the greater the volume of air. So uh, trying to move a, a large volume of, of uh, cool air in the summertime and moving a lesser volume of uh, warm air in the wintertime. We've taken a look at a couple of different geometries, kit of parts. I want to keep coming back to that. So uh, we have uh, us architects in the room know we have issues of, of using, occupying uh, atriums or using them for air movement and for circulation. It's not allowed by code. Uh, 
or if it is, it's very difficult, extremely restrictive. So we've taken a look at a dual building uh, with what we're calling a cyclone in the center. We'll talk a little bit about that, but it's an air accelerator, non-occupied gizmo that plugs into supplying uh, cool air from ground couplings below the building. The exterior skins, we have two south elevations and two north elevations. We get a lot of air movement out of the west elevation also. So whatever wall is in the sun is collecting the heat, moving it into a building automated system. Whatever's not in the sun gets seeded uh, on the cold side. And then taking a look at the possibility in places other than the United States of occupied atriums where you could actually move air. Once again, so it's kit of parts. Missing one image there. So the, uh, the, the, the model that we're looking at, this would be the living wall. These would be the living walls, each of these four walls. Cross section through the building showing the hurricane, the, uh, the cyclone that has the ground coupling, uh, heat exchangers in the basement. The air is uh, pulled through the interior of the building through interstitial floor systems, raised floor systems, which are now have become uh, mainstream approaches and then ventilating that uh, connected through the space and then into the exterior uh, walls. There it is. Didn't know that was a progression. You tricked me. <laughs> so here's, an, here's a, 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 basically a mid-morning approach. We're looking at the southern elevation of a, uh, of a housing project. We've moved these interstitial walls out to the western elevation. We have a cyclone in the center. Uh, we're warming up the southern elevation. Um, through the mid-morning, we're distributing the, the cold air from heat exchangers below the cyclone out into the floor plate, exhausting that, uh, that heat through the floor plates and then out through the interstitial wall system. We've done uh, quite a bit of mathematical modeling. I'll spare you most of the integrals because us architects run the computers as soon as we see that stuff. We get sweaty palms. But uh, the idea is, is that the cold air could be supplied through, and we're working on trying to accelerate air through the cyclone through the floor system, centralized cool air in the center, uh, exhausted at the end, and then the, the, uh, the living wall on the exterior is part of this interstitial wall. So the interstitial wall not only collects heat and draws that heat off into a central system, it also allows for the uh, generation of this thermal uplift and thermal gradient moving air, ventilating the building through it. There's a zoomed in version of it. We're back into this living wall here. We're going to keep zooming in and taking a look at this wall, the business end of what we're talking about. So cold air supply through these interstitial floor systems, exhaust from below through the perimeter, connected directly into the interstitial wall. We're able to, uh, to produce more than three times as much volume of air movement through interstitial wall movement than we need. So the movement of air um, through these spaces is not the issue so much as the control of it. So here's zooming in on the wall itself, the interstitial wall, in the uh, interstitial wall, and this being a living wall. We figure this would probably be three or four inches uh, across. These are the hydrogels that we were talking about, where we have heat generating in the exterior space uh, within this outside wall, interstitial wall, outside curtain wall here. Basically, a, a, a vertical greenhouse, a very narrow vertical greenhouse. The heat is pumped by the hydrogel into the phase change material. It's drawn off, whether it be air or by liquid. I believe liquid is probably more efficient into a central system. The interior layer is an insulated layer in order to keep the interior temperature at 70 degrees. Not only do you need to do that for the thermal comfort of, of the space, but you also need to maintain a very large delta T. The greater the delta T, the faster that pump will work. If the same principles works within the interstitial wall. So if we're able to accelerate the amount of heat that's, ex that's exposed on the outside and maintain a constant 70 degrees inside, this differential will allow for this pump to work very efficiently. This is zooming in even further into this idea of architectural ordering. So we're looking at the I layer, the, um, the, the exchange layer, the E layer, uh, and the collection layer, the C layer. Each has its own uh, thermal properties. Obviously, for example, the Collection layer C would be similar to the actual use of the, the thermal um, variable C, which would be very high conductivity. The insulative layer would have very low conductivity. These being the hydrogels interconnected with the phase change material would allow for the heat transfer of the exchange through the center of the wall as the heat builds up on the outside within this interstitial space. 
So not to make you think that I haven't totally been corrupted. We have developed a number of fairly, uh, we believe, accurate and, and well-quantified um, mathematical model approaches. Uh, in here, we were, we've been able to reasonably uh, calculate the volume. Ooh. Calculate the volume of this interstitial wall, the uh, temperature differential, the volume of space, the volume of the uh, of the wall, and we're able to calculate uh, in terms of uh, cubic feet and uh, air changes per hour what those numbers are. So far, we have um, at least at this level, we have been able to uh, have far more air heat and cooling than we need. Same goes on the ventilation. So we're looking at not only the cooling power, the um, Ventilation power, the uh, the number of uh, the amount of the ventil ventilation rate, cubic feet per minute. Uh, we're able to uh, calculate the speed of the air column. In this case, we've got call it six miles an hour. We've transposed it into six miles into miles an hour because at three, three and a half, four miles per hour is the kick in uh, for um, micro wind. So we're interested in trying to integrate micro wind within the skin. Micro wind generators are often the size of your thumb. So you integrate that with the interstitial space. So we have quite a bit of uh, thermal uplift. And then insulation, we're able to accurately calculate the amount of heat that's within that wall and what's available uh, in order to help fuel the system. So really, heat is what drives us. It drives it within the wall. It drives it within the horizontal workings of the hydrogel within the wall. It also works to move the air vertically through the interstitial space uh, within the wall. So here's a little animation. This is morning, early morning. Blue is, of course, it's color coded. We have these, col these colors coded to temperature. So we're looking at the southern elevation. We're looking at probably about 9 o'clock. Uh, it's on a typical um, um, solstice day. Um, the, the sun comes up. We've got four walls. We've got two southern walls and two northern walls. We didn't model the western wall in this case. But this kind of shows the, the progression of how the wall would heat up. That heat becomes enough to move the column of air through that wall at a very uh, rapid speed, about <coughs> six miles an hour. We're taking the heat from here, pumping it out, and seeding the upper part of the northern wall here and the northern wall here. So that red you see along these walls here is a result of moving that heat from this side to this side, southern wall here. That piece in the middle is the cold air supply from down below. That's pumped, that's being drawn by the floors on either side into the exhausting, exhausting into the interstitial wall space. Now in mid-afternoon, it's probably about 3 o'clock, the entire building is being uh, ventilated. We're trying to move as much air as we possibly can. We're trying to uh, collect as much heat as we possibly can. And then as you get towards the end of the day, this can continue on because the, the, this kind of, uh, this amount of heat can be stored within the building and then continuing to uh, ventilate the uh, interstitial wall by seeding them long after the sun is the sun is Why is the cyclone so much colder than the walls? Uh, it's ground coupled. It's 58 degrees, pretty much uh, straight up. Uh, we're able to move that volume of Air you saw was 200, it's 270,000 cubic feet per minute, it's a lot of air. So we're drawing that out, and we have, we have a sufficient draw and a sufficient cold air, a sufficient cold air supply that we're uh, able to supply that at 60 degrees. So that's why the bottom of the cycle is so, is so much colder. Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff, you did I bring it down to earth for you? Do you believe me? I sure hope so. So as Kurt says and John says, this is very theoretical. We are hoping to, we are hoping to establish partnerships uh, with a number of think tanks uh, and manufacturers and designers. Uh, some of those people you could probably imagine uh, who they might be. 
uh, but certainly uh, today we had a meeting with the architectural team talking about potential partnerships. A lot of this stuff comes directly out of NREL. We you know about the open sourcing through the patents of NREL, and so trying to work with some of the people directly at NREL, not only through Energy Plus development, but also through technology development, and then also some offshoot companies that have, that have been a result of uh, NREL's uh, open uh, patent policy. Those people are in town. There are a lot of window and skin uh, companies that have been developed here that uh, may well uh, help us to develop this further. I believe that uh, our expectations are that this will continue on after the NSF funding uh, and into product development, first, first um, prototyping uh, and then product development. As John says, we don't plan on building a prototype any bigger than a square meter. My hope uh, is, is that we can eventually start developing actual analog prototypes um, after this project uh, is, uh, is done with its NSF funding. We are, however, doing extensive computer modeling, as you can see. So I wanted to uh, have John finish up. We have a number of inter interfaces that we've been working with universities, uh, particularly uh, University of Colorado Boulder. All right, so i just like to quickly uh, wrap up on everything by introducing the introducing the education uh, activities related to this project or beyond this project. So one thing we're, we're being, uh, working on a co-founded uh, program called uh, Building System Program, the BSP, which is a program right now I'm at the CU Boulder, um, with an emphasis on and, uh, engineering for developing community. Some of you uh, here are more familiar with the, the, the developed countries' construction sites, right? So, so go there, you, you understand what I'm talking about. I've been involved in several projects. U.S. Uh, recently most are about a retrofit existing building, like Empire State, State Buildings, the prop, uh, uh, retail stores, all stuff. Really talking about it, not much new constructions. The recent project working on the Chicago Botanic Garden, it's small scale compared to what is happening in China right now. Um, but what I'm saying is like, I've been there a few times a year, Look at the construction in Mexico, China, Brazil. There's a big, big need uh, from the developed country like U.S. or Germany, uh, Finland even. Uh, they want to look at some technologies can be used in their uh, uh, context design. So that's why I've developed this program. So I send students every summer to the to the field uh, for three, uh, from four to six weeks. Uh, they they try to understand the culture and tradition. Uh, context because not everything we developed here can be used right away or immediately in, in, in those constructions. There's a lot of, lot of constraints, uh, regulations, uh, limitations. For example, just give you quick examples like heat pump right now. Ground source heat pump is already being promoted everywhere in China, which I don't think is right because you guys understand, depending on the climate, some climate cannot use heat, ground source heat pump at all. Now they're just they reward every product. If you have cross source heat pump, they give you money. Okay, they want everybody. So every professor, every design institute, design companies doing the cross source heat pump right now. Okay, so this is just small uh, uh, examples. And also, um, we developed some courses, workshops for uh, those Mexico, uh, Mexican countries, uh, uh, universities, Chinese universities, to help them to understand what exactly we say is sustainability here in developed countries. And another project, uh, education activities, we developed uh, called Sustainable Bias Design uh, Residential Academic Program, SDV RAP program at CU Boulder. This is the expo, let the uh, undergrad students live in the residential hall. They can understand sustainability from the very beginning. So we offer a sustainable class in the hall, in the residential hall, not the campus. And because you guys know, CU has a, a quite a few uh, green buildings, at least 35 buildings, like a William Village, the new, the new uh, residential hall. So we use those buildings as a living, um, uh, I say, living tool or machine to help students understand uh, by hands on, touching, looking at, understand what, what we mean, define the sustainability, and how they can understand the principle of those designs. So this is open to all the students in engineering or architecture field. So they don't have to be in the building area or architecture site. Okay? 
So they understand that the general, the water, the conservation, the environment issues, all this stuff. And the student pay extra fee. Actually, they're willing to pay extra fee. It's about like a fifteen hundred dollar a semester by taking those uh, data gate classes off the small size classes off in the, the residential halls. So this is another project we're working on. So recently, spring 2000, this year, uh, 2012, the local art uh, jams crew from Rocky Mountain Institute off the class. So we invite all the uh, people, local people who are interested in teaching this kind of class. We're, we're welcome. You guys join us, give the lectures, we see you pay all the stipend, whatever, supporting to teach those classes. So I, I just wanted to highlight two education uh, actives ran and going. We're still going to continue to expand those programs in the next two years. Hopefully by the next five, ten years, it become a, a pretty strong programs uh, locally or globally. Right. That's pretty much what I want to say. Anything else you want to occur? Right on the end. All right, so now we can give the whole floor for questions. <laughs> So, in order to understand the fundamentals, mechanisms, certainly we have to use CFD to simulate those airflow, water flow inside and, and with the, the turbulence. So definitely, that's what we're going to do. But the, with the hope is eventually one something can be used for design purpose. So, you guys understand CFD takes time to model a simple wall. We get the whole building, so part of one of these CFD to simulate those small addings, whatever inside the wall. So with the hope we eventually can develop some correlations of formulas uh, basically uh, conclude all this relationship in relation, uh, the heat transverse of uh, so eventually we want, we want to remove those in the need of uh, using CFD for the whole building design. So that's the big hope. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where are the materials that you Talking about producing large scale buildings, how is it? How is that space change material produced? Oh, okay. So this is the basic. Our project doesn't do any perfection of the space change materials. We're going to look at all the, the current market space change material, which personally I believe it's already there, although they're not widely available. But I was already be contacted by quite a few, let's say, about ten companies that already contacted me, say, hey, we do have a fantastic products here. Can you just try this? So it's not our goal to develop a new phase change materials ourselves in a new form of formula or something. It's not our goal. But we'll look at a, a, a feasibility of using different kinds of phase change materials to integrate them in our holding materials. Okay, we still have to consider our reliability, the same issues, and the size, all the stuff. Because the, the holding material, like you see, the policy mediums have different sizes. Part of what I do is, is try to develop concentrating systems, architectural, structural systems, in order to concentrate heat. So phase change material is off the shelf. We'd be using a waxing material. 
um, that goes to liquid at a specified temperature. It's just a matter of utilizing latent heat within the law in order to accentuate the idea of heat collection and we would draw it off. Yeah, there are quite a lot of products that are already available. I have to introduce a product this year to uh, China rural area. They used uh, the the method they use to heat the space during the winter, they don't have any heating system at all. What they use is use a, what they call calm. I don't know if any of you heard about the calm is a bat. This is with a brake, make it like a bat, the bat systems. And then they're cooking, they have the waste heat from the cooking using biomass actually. And the waste heat cooking supply into the, the, the bat, right? And then they heat the, the calm, people sleep on that. They feel warm. Well, this convection is actually much more efficient than the convection systems. And they don't have to heat the whole space, but they only need this, the vents, the area during the night. But the big question for that is, the only heat at the first two hours, three hours, it's too hot actually, because you cook it, right? All the waste heat suddenly get into the concrete, the concrete vent, and it heat up uh, even to like 200 degrees C. You don't even need it, okay? And then, but it, it dropped down very quickly, and until like the 2 p.m. or 12 p.m. Yeah, it's already dropped down back to zero degrees C. So the, the very efficient way is so phase changing materials. So now you supply the heat into the phase changing materials and you basically flatten the peak, right? And you make sure this heat can last until four or five, eight hours, let's say. So that's a simple solution and we already have the product for that. Yeah. With the airflow in the central tube, Make a conical shape and then change the amount of air flowing through each floor. Can't you amplify the air pressure at the top? At the top? That's the idea. We're, 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 we're uh, calling a number of people, including Crane's Lane and uh, Dyson. We're also talking to General Electric in order to understand how the fin action works in accelerating the columns of air. The idea of the column is to, is to increase the volume as you go higher and if you increase the temperature or hopefully to accelerate that column of air. And then increase the amount of air in each floor, so you have more air flow at top to right. the bottom. Right. But, but that, that, once again, is not the main focus of our research. Our, our business end is the wall, where, where these ancillary systems are. We're trying to plug in to make this whole system work. How many other research projects are you materials, we're not the first, first one or only one. But in terms of this concept, yes, we're the only one. And actually, we, there are 10 projects funded in 2008, sort of after eight. That's, that's in the history of National Science Foundation, they've never ever found any single buildings, which is a sad story. So, but that 2008 with some uh, uh, smart program manager, they decided, they said there's a huge need or, or, you know, something we don't even understand. Well, there's a lot of issues people saw. We handled very well. The building, where's the building? What, what, what do you mean by mental state the building? That's, that's the, they said, oh, you don't, you don't talk to National Science, National Science Foundation. You talk to National, the Department of Energy. You talk to application. You really know everything about a building, okay? So that's only, that's 2008. There are 10 projects uh, of funding by National Science Foundation, but there are different angles. Somebody talk about glazing, some talk about uh, green roofs, so we're the only team to talk about this building. The thing about EFRI is Working Frontiers of Research and Innovation. Specifically, they wanted a multidisciplinary team. That's how I got Shepard Hook into the project with all these smart engineers. This is they specifically wanted architects and engineers to work together uh, on these projects in order to create this integrated design approach. This is the first time that's been How much is it going to throw off the heat balance if the building is 40% window area? Window area. That's, that's Alecca back there. Yeah, she knows what she's talking about. So, <coughs> so say it again, Alecca. Yeah. How much is it going to throw off the heat balance if the building is 40% window area? Well, it's, uh, it's isolated. It, you're basically the glass, the glazing you were looking at in the model is an isolated um, space, much like a greenhouse would be. So the, the building envelope it is definitely not 40%. The exterior skin, you're trying to gain the air airflow, air movement through, is indeed 100%. Oh, but so it's an isolated, yeah, it's an isolated system. Yeah. You're basically looking at a vertical greenhouse. Yeah. 
but it's got about a foot and a half between it. We're trying to, Phil's question where I'm talking about turbulence and the, the, the depth of that versus the height and the airspeed movement creates turbulence. We're trying to tune that, which I'm sure you understand far better than I do, but, but that's an isolated um, exterior skin and not the interior skin. Right, and also, I want to ask you a question. We're not even sure about the, uh, the transmittance or whatever, the, the color of the living wall at the moment. It could be 50% uh, translucent, let's say. It could still be look like it. You can still have daylight, uh, efficient light get, get into the space. It's kind of like uh, windows. Okay? So, so far, we don't even have to look at that at the opaque wall or something. Yeah, it's not opaque, it's definitely translucent. We're hoping to get uh, T-Vis of 30 to 40 percent, if we're lucky. Um, but it, it would be a polymer, and we're, we were just talking there in a meeting about trying to find the appropriate polymer manufacturer that has a translucent panel that would allow for these hydrogels to be injected within the manufacturing process to increase this heat flow capacity within a translucent panel. Right, the only, only challenge here is really look at it. Do we want this uh, the living wall kind of like structurally Structural material, or just uh, hey, this is the material just for similar purpose. Yeah. So if we have to look at it as a structure of supporting materials, now we have to think about a lot of constraints, right? The, the, the stress, all, all the stuff. Uh, so this this side we haven't decided yet, or, or we don't know yet. Uh, this is also depending on the polymer people to look at the, their materials eventually. How big? Just like you guys remember, the size we're talking about, those guys were very small, right? So I expand that way into a uh, Inch, one inch, or one foot. It's already being challenging. So, so if we look at a one meter or the whole wall, we're not sure at the moment that we, what is the mechanical uh, practice of those, those wall systems. Um, property manager, uh, Lisa, uh, Sounds like we get more than enough ventilation for fresh air through these wall systems. But keep that in mind, we still have to optimize the ventilation rate based on heat transfer. Because it's not just about supply fresh air. If you all talk about heat recovery, right, heat transfer, how much do you want to bring in? If you supply more very quick, basic temperature gradient in out, uh, it's about one degree Fahrenheit, maybe, right? If you supply slowly, right, you make up more data T. So really, we talk about is entropy difference, the income outcome. Yeah. So the answer that's a free entry we can take. This is all the current study going to optimize that. Hey, what's the best burn rate? What's the best cap, uh, cavity size? So now we can get the most heat recovery rate. So that's the most important one. After that, we probably find hey, this is AC we still got a uh, 20 CFM per person. That's good enough as the pressure. Or you say hey, based on your optimization, we only got. 3 CFM per person, it's not good enough. So we have to use a backup system, use a mechanical system to supply remaining CFM, okay? So we're hoping by optimizing that, we can get 100% fresh air through the small system. That's a hope. But we're still not sure, because we have to look at heat transfer coefficient, again, resistance, all this stuff. A momentous occasion. John has never uttered the word Fahrenheit before. You've got to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's great. Uh, there's no 
nothing really new in architecture, uh, but things that are new are things like technology, materials, techniques, etc. Right? Uh, but I just want to say this is very complicated, but it's very exciting. And I also want to point out that you talk about biomimicry and human skin in the beginning and sort of loss at some point, but I just want to say that what you're doing follows um, classical principles of architecture. So you're practicing cla principles of classical architecture because in classical Greece, for instance, nature was the paradigm of functional excellence and what was held, was held that way. And what's interesting is technology is not going back to that in many, many ways, not just in technology, but in computer science and all kinds of things. So you're on the cutting edge again. For a different right. Uh, I just came out very more. Actually, we, we did a study about it like five years ago. It's my student. Still, it's widely cited by architecture field, actually, where the topic is what we can learn from old buildings it's a little bit vernacular architecture. Yeah. So we published a, a paper actually. It's still received an email yesterday from a, a, a Harvard University professor working on all this. I see there's a lot of stuff we can learn from the natural vernacular architects. You guys know better than me. It's designed and built by local people. They never learn, they never go to college. They learn from their father, grandfather, right? And the building will be there, church, all this stuff. Fantastic performance. I see people don't really should learn that. But now we just take advantage of the, some advanced materials, advanced tools yeah. to reframe that, basically, the different range. So that's why, again, I always call myself a low tech guy. I'm not a high tech people. Low tech, because I'm a lot talking about passive technologies, which I believe the building envelope all relate to the passive stuff. Tice knows our chair. I was expecting a crazy, crazy question. So. <laughs> I was pitching myself, though, well, where is it, where is it, I know it's okay. Maybe take one more, can you guys stick around? Yes, yeah, one more yeah. question, for sure. Um, so, uh, I'm just wondering what it would feel like to walk around the building. Um, we all know how highly reflective sur surfaces on normal buildings uh, contribute to the heat ion effect. Um, in a sense, you're still doing the same thing because you're taking heat, and instead of allowing the sink into some sink in the ground, you're, you know, pushing it back out again. So how does this contribute to the heat ion effect compared to normal reflective surfaces? How would it feel if you were on the outside of the building? Um, heat ion effect, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. on, on, a, on a minuscule, microscopic level, yeah, it will affect heat ion. But I mean, what's it feel like in the building? It would be open, it would be airy, it would be uh, light, there would be diffuse light, um, there would be fresh air. Um, the air would feel fresh because it's moving fairly rapidly more rapidly than you used to, but not something that the papers are falling down. You've got uh, a really interesting and cool exterior skin that you'd probably be able to see from the inside. Um, we think it would be a great leap forward in the design opportunities for commercial and high-rise buildings. So the, the, the contribution of utilizing, of using heat effect, the, the insulation heat effect, in order to create enough thermal gradient to move air through the building, and it's a contribution to Heat island effect citywide. I don't. I don't think it would be that large of a well, issue. Can right. I follow that up? I, I don't actually remember you saying. When, I mean, you're absorbing a certain amount, and you're probably rejecting a certain amount. I didn't hear 100% absorption. You don't know that yet. What, yeah, what was we, your model based on? 50%? Well, those uh, those spreadsheets I ran by you really quick. The one that said insulation told you exactly how many kBTUs there are. It's I, a I didn't ton. It. One ton. It's a whole bunch of heat. Uh, a lot of that's going into the system in order to seed the cold walls and the move, and the move systems and, okay. and so on. But uh, some of it gets exhausted through the top. We've talked about using heat exchangers to recapture that at the top. But our main interest is to move a lot of air through the building. And a heat exchanger is going to is going to neck that uh, air velocity down. So, so, not so my, my personal dream will be if we can use uh, the heat generated for all the part of the building, just like a Byron's Rogers buildings, downtown area where I was involved somehow, and they use a south facade, a south facade, north facade, separated that chill being right, just, they can uh, rotate the heat as needed for the south or north side. I think that's, that's some kind of idea of thinking if we can accumulate collective heat somewhere, we don't need it. 
and dump into a basement, let's say, hey, that's a really cool basement, where do you heat up? Right? Could you, well, certainly it's hard to manage 100% uh, zero, because it depends on the climate, like Phoenix, like, come on, it's, it's a hot climate, you cannot just right, get a hot, zero uh, balance, but that, that's hoping by good design, which is with the help with the architects, right, smart architects, and help with all this group run, storage, all stuff, and, and so, the same thing if you use the storage, basically we can reduce the amount of uh, uh, insulation of materials, basically. Just think about it, if we use the concrete as a solar storage, versus use the base candy materials as uh, solar storage, basically you use the big concrete, and you use this little tiny base <coughs> candy material, you can get the same function. So, so that's, that's, that's a, again, the dream. Is it conceivable that you could have a building large enough or a neighborhood of these buildings uh, that would be relying on the ground transfer that you would affect the, the ground temperature and perhaps it could accumulate over like year after year where you would lose efficiency? Good question. It's so, it's so important we have a name for it. It's called the sling you can imagine. So on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis, you, uh, you meter the amount of cooling energy you're taking out of the sink and equal the amount of cool, that amount of cooling energy back in at night in the cool climates and the cool parts of the, of the week or the month and the year. And certainly even a greater issue would be if your thermal sink happens to be the ocean or the Chesapeake Bay or the Allegheny River in Pittsburgh or any of these other kind of uh, natural systems. You don't want to substantially change the temperature of that. So there would be a, a requirement for a, a, a zero net energy extraction of cold energy uh, that would be metered, and you can't you can't put more in, you can't put less in. You want to maintain a zero. So the zero energy includes not only the operations of the building, also its effect on the environment. So would that exclude uh, tropics from these kinds of release? Well, yeah, the temperature in the in the in the soil changes as you go further south. Albuquerque is four degrees warmer than here. So instead of 58, that's 62, and as you go further south, yeah, there's issues. But they have these buildings in uh, in Nairobi in, uh, in Africa, and they're very successful, and it's an extremely hot climate. So, and, and the interior temperature is, is well below 80 degrees for these kind of ground coupled uh, ventilated buildings. Those are standard ground coupling with ventilation systems, but what we're doing is taking the next step. Uh, 